Hi, I'm Jatender Kavataker, Managing Director of Accenture Ventures and also a board member on the Silicon Valley Forum. I'm here with Megan Smith, Hello. former VP at Google, third CTO of the United States under the Obama administration. I'm such a pleasure to, to meet you. Thanks. I have a number of questions that okay. I really, um, it's been at me for quite a while and, and it's on the minds of a lot of people and I'm sure yours as well. But let's start with a few basic questions to get into it. Mm -hmm. With all the technology that's evolving even faster every year, if you look in the next five years, what specific technology areas are you really intrigued by and really watching? Does anything come to mind there? A lot. You know, we, yeah. at the end of administration, we hosted an a event called Frontiers with the teams in Pittsburgh and, and, and the uh, CMU and University of Pitt. We focused in on Frontiers in five sections. Personal frontiers, like the brain initiative, personalized medicine, personalized learning, all of that work. Second one was about community. And if you think about local, a lot of times in Silicon Valley, we're focused on sort of smart city, but there's also kind of smart, wise community. So a lot of data science and other work around justice, around economic inclusion, around the environment, and, and sort of how do our urban and lived environments get better, and how do our communities include everyone and accelerate. Um, a lot of extraordinary work in the area of AI and data science as our national focus of the frontiers. We focused on AI, and we had done the work for the president um, around AI. The focus there was on how should the policy teams help and not in, impinge. So law and policy, safety control, acceleration, using AI in more places. Um, and then, of course, our global frontiers around climate and green energy. What an incredible, all of my science fair and early yeah, stuff. That's right. You know, Jimmy Carter was putting solar yeah. panels at the White there House, go, and yeah. I was inspired into wow, wow. impact-based stuff. But it's so exciting. I was just talking to Mike Cassidy, who's working on a fusion energy company. I mean, the, the opportunity for the country and the world around shifting into what will be a clean energy future is incredibly exciting. I'm disappointed with the climate summit decisions, but uh, uh, we'll get there. The, the world is, is with us. And then the final, the final one we focused on was space and interplanetary frontiers. And that one was uh, opened by the um, Roddenberry family. You know, it's the 50 year anniversary oh, of Star, yeah. Trek. Star Trek. And, yes. you know, we're getting SpaceX, Blue Origin, but also the journey to Mars, um, amazing stuff, both in exploration. Pluto, you know, we're the only country with uh, rovers up on Mars. So there's extraordinary work going on in planetary. And one of my favorite things about Star Trek is not only the tech, like beaming and, you know, sort of tricorders and these things, but also the fact that everybody was on the bridge, mm -hmm. that the diversity of humanity is represented. And I think that's another frontier that is really an opportunity in the tech sector. Wow. And the way that I think about that is not only all these amazing tech, you know, I just gave you a list of a huge set of buckets yeah. framed by those frontiers, but what if we fielded the whole team? Like, what if we didn't have this weird culture of, oh, there's technical people and not technical people? Because it's just untrue, right? Uh, it's how we socialize each other, how we don't tell stories of some people who do tell stories of others. I'm so excited to see Hidden Figures. The mm -hmm. film. Yeah, love that. Love that movie. Yeah, you know there were Mercury Seven and Mercury Thirteen, the women astronauts. Why don't we tell these stories of the truth that all of humanity has always been awesome the whole well, in time? Well, in the same way, Star Trek gave us a vision for for the the future and, and space travel. That vision is starting to crystallize now. We need yeah. these smaller visions to emerge to really open us up to these to these uh, great things. And so the media is a great platform to create those. Mm -hmm. Do you get involved in the media side? Do you, yeah, do you get lot. involved in helping coach and advise on projects? In yeah, we did, uh, we did a project. Um, I started this work at Google. Uh, I realized early on, just measuring the Google Doodles and working with that team, this is not my team, but in the marketing group, um, that it was we were like 80-20 celebrating men versus women, which is crazy. You know, there's 50-50. Yeah. And so it took four years to get to that point, but now the Google team celebrates 50-50. You have to force yourself to notice the biases. I think it's like eight to one on speaking lines in most films, mm. men's lines to women's lines. We're 15 to one boy programmers to girl programmers and children's TV. So the media that we watch all day tells us who does what. And it's really diminishing for some people and building for others. And we've got to change that. It's quite urgent. We can actually use vision and AI and these tools to help us with this bias we're stuck with, and I've seen USC, mm -hmm. uh, the Southern California teams are doing really interesting AI work around media analysis in that way. You know, that, that, that's absolutely the case. Those those numbers are there. But you know, I, I was a, a judge at uh, uh, the kind of innovation challenge that the Tech Award Tech Museum does, and yeah. it's, it's with the kids, right? Yeah. And 
and it was a pretty balanced group. Which is great. Which so is we're great. starting so to see good, we're seeing progress. If you can, to any kid, boy, girl, uh, different races, if they understand what is this tech for, mm -hmm. it's just not abstract, but you're like doing purposeful things, it's actually active, like hands-on. You don't go into a PE class and say, open your books, we're going to read about baseball. Yeah. You do it. You do so it. do science and tech, science fair, projects, project-based learning. If you um, know that people like you do it, and so being better about, more accurate with the history of teams, yeah. uh, looking at the photos, a friend of mine saw a photo of the ENIAC, uh, which is the first digital computer in the United States, Eckerd and Mockley, these two young uh, programmers, our hardware guys did this, but there's women in the pictures, and she yeah. found out they're the first digital programmers in America, yeah. right, a nearly lost 70 year story, you know, yeah. our Bledsley Park. And then the fourth one is encouragement. So just encouraging everybody mm -hmm. and making sure that it's fun and hands-on and impactful and clear, it will get everyone in. I, I was in China in the early 90s and uh, you know we were opening up China for Hewlett Packard and so we set up an R&D center there. And of course it was uh, privatizing some of the government arms uh, to mm -hmm. create labs with uh, joint partnerships with foreign companies. Uh, and the leaders were women. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it was pretty interesting to see. It's interesting that the, with the Frontiers Conference I was talking about, um, there was a fabulous uh, engineer on stage from Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' company, and she, she said they live in Seattle. Her husband works at Boeing, and the, her children were arguing, and her son was saying, no, the girls work on rockets, and the boys work on airplanes. <laughs> okay. Right? So whatever it is that you're told by what your family situation right. is, that's what you think is true. And so making sure that um, we're really pulling everyone in. Silicon Valley really has a, a problem right now with uh, diversity, inclusion, and massive bias, and systemic uh, uh, division that we need to really just have the will. And it's been great to see, you know, from the White House, we did a lot of work on this, and we saw Intel and Slack and Microsoft and other people, et cetera, was doing people really paying attention and taking it. Of course, everyone has it as a priority, but it's in the top 25. Yeah. Those companies are moving it to the top three and realizing that it's actually related to shareholder value as much as the right thing to do. I mean, there's a circular relationship in, in the society. So, so, you know, climate change, big societal changes, even at the, at, like you say, the first frontier being the human, these, these are uncharted territories for the mm -hmm. most part. And of course, technology is a part of this, but the attitude going to this is another part of this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that, you know, we innovate at people versus innovating with people mm -hmm to create the, 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 the realities that they want to have. Right. So specifically the question I've had, and I've been, I've been asking this question to a lot of people is, you know, as we start seeing the, the machine and AI and automation start to do things that are habitual to humans, and if, if we truly are creatures of habit, habit is an algorithm that a machine can go do for you. Mm -hmm. The question is, what's more in a human than being a habit? And how do you, is it, do you, first two questions, do you believe that there's, more to humans than what machines can do ultimately. And if there is, how do you extract that and have that human exercise their innate abilities? What, what does that mean in this new world as, as automation comes around and, and as we go further into the future? What is the role of the human in the future? So I have a, a funny answer to that, which is um, I, I think there's roles that are big and interesting, but I think that one of the greatest things we need to do is broaden the field. And as we sort of make it less rigid that AI applies to this and not that, yeah. you know, why isn't AI applying to helping us, you know, give you an example from government. We feed 22 million children in the free and reduced lunch programs for school and after school breakfast. In the summer, we feed 6 million wow. because we can't get our act together to debug this very complex system. But we have things like Uber and Lyft, and so we're busy on certain problems with our most advanced technologies and other problems just wait mm -hmm. and languish. And there are extraordinarily talented people working on those. They just don't, aren't playing the whole orchestra. Is that an, so, economic, is that an economic choice for the innovators? Uh, I think it's... Um, are we stuck there? I think it's partly like what's getting priority based on who thinks, who's technical. Mm -hmm. So getting more people to realize that the tech boundaries don't need to be so rigid right. And anyone can work on anything. I think part of diversifying tech is to techify everything else. Because mm -hmm. diverse people are working on many problems, not these problems. They're working on lots of problems. So how do you broaden what we think is important to work on mm -hmm. for vision and AI and other things, mm -hmm. data science? And we were able to bring the first ever US chief data scientist, DJ Patel, came DJ. into my team and did an extraordinary job 
And of course, we have great data science and government at NASA and NIH. But down here, Department of Labor has extraordinary Bureau of Labor Statistics with fabulous quant and economics, but not real-time data in the data science way we mean. We created a data science cabinet, because mm -hmm. cabinets okay. are cool. Yeah. So <laughs> they became a community practice. And instead of people trying to individually upgrade each agency, they could work together and come up with rubrics of what does it mean to have privacy and data management and you know, real-time dashboards and that kind of work. And so as we do that and bring that to housing and urban development and these places, it's exciting. We were able to do opportunity.census.gov. Census is the biggest big data uh -huh. thing anyway. Yeah. So Treasure for cool. hundreds of years. Yeah. So what if just like we have our phones pulling from US Geological Survey with wonderful maps, what if, what data, President Obama opened 200,000 data sets, so what data does Housing and Urban Development, Department of Labor, Department of Education have? And instead of having the leaders and the, the secretaries of those agencies saying, oh, I want a website for this and that, they need to get out of that business, just like the US Geological Survey did. Of course, they're making some maps, but really they're releasing data yeah, yeah. in wonderful APIs. Uh, the weather teams at NOAA are releasing a billion dollar weather industry. So what kinds of things, and we were able to match you know, Airbnb, Redfin, Zillow with housing and urban development. Yeah. So HUD didn't have to make an app for that. Yeah. These guys could add features to their wildly popular products and do, as you say, design with. Yeah. So I think part of the way that we solve the AI challenges are by having more people have creative confidence right. to participate in the design of what AI would be so right. that more like 7 billion people are part of that. Yeah. You know, not just a tiny number of people deciding what the agenda is. The tiny number of people. We got to get away talented, from that. talented, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. everyone's talented. I'd love to get your comment on this. You know, India has, uh, you know, Digital India movement that um, uh, the Modi is, is driving and there's something called the India stack, if you've heard of this, and it's basically a, a stack, and uh, the Aadhaar platform is a way to authenticate uh, people. Mm -hmm. And really, it's, it's hundreds of millions of people now through the authentication mechanism of Aadhaar to be now on a digital plane. Mm -hmm. And in being part of that digital plane gives you access to healthcare and banking and education sure. and other things. And it's, a, it's tremendous to kind of see the energy behind that. It's early days, but it's starting to kind of And the emerge. quality. And know, the quality, the quality of, of services that yeah. can come. Yeah. So, what can we learn from that uh, for the United States? What are we doing in the United States to kind of kind of start to bring the you know reduce the digital divide? Mm -hmm. And and how do you know how do we how do we be more inclusive as a digital you know country? Yeah, so there's seven different pieces of that. When when we were in in, uh, in the White House, we focused on kind of three areas. One, the first two kind of capacity building the government. Mm -hmm both in the policy area, we call it tech IQ, TQ. <laughs> so having more people with TQ together with their economics Q, law Q, yeah, yeah. you know, operator Q, we've got a lot of colleagues in government who are not technical, but they know their fields. So thinking very cross-functional and not having us outside the room, but be part of that, like you would have a surgeon general. So techies in policy, just like others. And then also in terms of capacity building government, the services the government delivers should be awesome since we have Americans who make Amazon and Facebook and Google and Twitter and Dropbox. The way we do that is not the services, it's bringing those Americans into government, not to make everything because most governments should be procuring, but to choose the right architectures and ask the right questions with the other colleagues on these hard problems, demand the kind of design with, you know, the veterans team of the United States Digital Service, the 18F team, which is in the General Services Administration, yep. Presidential Innovation Fellows, yep. which are like entrepreneurs and residents, you know, Kennedy starts the Peace Corps, President Obama gets this crew. Mm -hmm. So design thinkers, front end, back end, let's get those Americans rotating in government in this generation, which we did, and now we brought over 500 Americans into government who built all those services, who rotate in a tour of service. Um, in terms of capacity building the American people, programs like Tech Hire, mm -hmm. uh, using code boot camps to get more people in, 70 cities are now doing that, fast track into these really higher paying jobs that are fun and collaborative and the companies are starving for. Mm -hmm. Computer science for all, you know, nine out of 10 parents want coding taught at school, now there's a whole movement of that happening in states and local, and it's very real and exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these are not partisan things, so they continue. Mm -hmm. uh, so just really an important stuff to be doing. Um, in terms of the divide, one of the things that I found really interesting, I came across this because when Google, when we started Google Crisis Response, mm -hmm. part of it was during Katrina and then during Haiti. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment where some of the backhaul team, you know, sort of the fiber teams and others, were on an email thread 
And they responded with really creative ideas. They had been in touch with people in Port-au-Prince. Mm -hmm. The landing station was down. They had gone in the warehouse. They were like, how about we send this? Right. And because the technical people had a conversation, yeah. we were able to send that as a donation, $250,000, not cash, but stuff. USAID transported it. And the internet connectivity of Haiti, which went off a cliff, came back in like two weeks. Yeah. That would not have happened if the professional right. backhaul you know, Follow teams the, the, hadn't the spoken process. with each other yeah. in their way. And I found in government, one of the digital divide challenges on the connectivity layer is that the connectivity engineers aren't rotating as a tour of service to be kind of surgeon generals on decisions. Mm -hmm. So the ICT ministers and everybody, our own, the policy people are there, but the technical people aren't there. So we've got vendors and we're just not moving fast enough. So we're working on something called Global Connect for the US and other countries that has a connectivity core mm -hmm. position like USDS for the backhaul teams to rotate and really accelerate the architecture of how we can move faster. These are big, these are big things you're going after. What's, what's next? What are you going to do now? I'm working on a new company. I want to continue to run at these challenges, nice. so uh, working on that. Um, one of the first projects we're doing is with some colleagues, uh, something called the Tech Jobs Tour. Uh, Leanne Pittsford, who started Lesbians Who Tech. So it's uh, 50 cities, 100,000 jobs, one year go. We'll be in Birmingham, Alabama next week. And so, you know, think of a bar at night with kind of like TechCrunch Recode right. meets Barnum and Bailey, fun <laughs> tech jobs Excellent. everywhere. Excellent. Well, you're, you're a force uh, for the United States, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. Good luck on everything, and we'll watch how things are going for you. Thanks. It's, okay. uh, it was amazing. I encourage everyone to serve your country, no matter which country you're from, Very good. to rotate into government. It's essential. Thank you.